Hi, welcome to my channel. All right, I want to talk one-on-one -on -one with you. Um, I get so, whenever I do these videos, I become so involved in how I look and um, a friend of mine told me just talk it out and that, um, hopefully the power will stay on. Um, for this one, this topic I'm talking about, which is the tree of life in Kabbalah and some sense of Kabbalah altogether, um, it's something very important and something especially that I don't want to be distracted by camera looks and everything. And I might get, I'm in my head, I'm thinking people are not even paying attention to what I'm talking about. They're making comments about the curtain and who knows what, but all right, I'm just talking straight, uh, between you and me. Um, what is Kabbalah? Well, what is Kabbalah in general? I'm Jewish. Um, uh, there, you know, of course, of the Bible, um, the uh, Torah, and then the uh, prophets and the uh, writings all collected together as the, the uh, Tanakh. Uh, that's the acronym Torah, Nevi'im, which would mean prophets, roughly, and Kotavim, which would be writings. And they are what we uh, call the, the Jewish Bible. Uh, the order of the writings is slightly diff is sort of different. Um, it goes uh, the Torah, the, first, the five books of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then Nevi'im, the, I forget offhand, the major prophets, and then, then a few major prophets, and then there are like 12 or something minor prophets, and then uh, the writings, which go from, um, again, the order has been mismatched in uh, the Catholic and then the Protestant Bibles, but the Jewish Bible, the writings begin with Joshua, uh, no, sorry. No, Joshua is one of the prophets. Um, forget where the uh, writings begin, but it ends with um, Chronicles. Uh, there are two, it, which is basically split into two books. Anyway, all right. <clears throat> In addition to the, to the Jewish Bible, there's the Talmud, which was um, written uh, roughly 2,000 years ago. Um, it's a uh, series uh, divided into six chapters, six books um, by the head of the, uh, essentially the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin at the time. And, uh, he's called Judah, the Prince, Prince being that he was head of the, this Sanhedrin. And then for quite a while, uh, there were different commentaries and then they were written in, um, finally making the Talmud. Okay. <clears throat> so there are two, so you have the Tanakh and we have the Talmud. And then the uh, third major uh, text of Judaism is, along with uh, commentaries, uh, there's another thing, Genesis Rabbah and Exodus Rabbah, uh, meaning great Genesis and great Exodus and so forth. These are commentaries on the books, uh, the five books of Moses. Um, the third real, and, and uh, uh, the third of these three um, is Kabbalah. And... Um, there are several major writings of Kabbalah. Be, um, depends on how far back you go. Um, the the uh, work of the chariot is a uh, refers to a time period of uh, in terms of the I think the prophet the times of the prophets um, way way back um, trying to understand and explain. Um, how the divine works, the nature of the divine, the nature of divinity, or the nature of the divine, nature of God, the nature of the universe. And it has a very, as Judaism itself is, it has a philosophical perspective. It's like you can talk about, be talking about the same thing, but it's, um, it has a philosophical bent and or philosophical application. No, uh, I guess you could say application. It's a phil philosoph, you can talk, you can take one thing and you can talk about its philosophical aspect. You can also see in it um, an understanding of the universe. Um, it's not meant to be, um, it's not meant to match with our science. It's more metaphysical. It's more um, spiritual in some sense, but it's more philosophical. Uh, a lot of the Basically, all of Judaism is philosophical. Um, 
even the Bible, the Torah, and uh, Jews take it to be very, they talk about it, the events in the Bible as, in, in philosophical terms, um, it's not so literal, although the more orthodox you get, the more, I suppose, fundamental and perhaps more literal, but even then, it's a mix of literal and philosophical intertwined. It's not so literal as Christians do with their Bible. All right, so in the midst of this, there's, because Jews are very curious, there's a quest, there's a zest to know, to understand how God operates, the nature of God, the nature of the universe, because um, God created the universe and God and the universe are one and we and God and the universe are one on some level and it becomes very philosophical and metaphysical, okay, and spiritual. Um, so that's what Kabbalah is. Um, and then it uses verses from the five books of Moses, typically five books of Moses, as proof texts. Like it will explain something and it'll say, um, for you see, you remember the verse, da da da, which then relates to what it's explaining. Okay, so there are several different texts in Kabbalah that have been written over the years. Um, the earliest that I can find is the Sefer Yetzirah. The next one, sort of in order, is the Bahir. And the next one is the Zohar. The Zohar is a huge, large, encyclopedic size volume of material. And then after that, um, there were um, uh, incongruities or there were uh, elements that uh, needed to be further explained. Um, at that point, as I recall, um, there was a yearning for a Messiah to come. To, uh, and it's not, this is not the Christian Messiah. Um, I have my own, I've been following my own theory about, or I, I've been following an interesting theory about the Christian, the origins of the Christian Messiah. It has nothing to do with that. Mashiach comes from the term Mashach, which means anoint. Mashiach means anointed one. Um, and uh, Isaac Luria came along and then gave lectures, uh, my understanding was, uh, basically spoke about uh, this need for rectification. His whole thing was that the world must be rectified, the world must be fixed in some sense, repaired. And the workings towards repairing the world will bring about the Mashiach. Um, about the same time as I understand it. Um, the, um, about the same time, Rome was, uh, Israel was under the protectorate of Rome and um, there was a, a push, a revolutionist, um, kind of sometimes terrorist um, sentiment in amongst the Jews in Israel to push the uh, Roman Roman occupation away and for independence because Rome had um, Israel was really a thorn inside of Rome um, during the Roman Empire um, there were there were uh, um, one of the um, we're talking about the there were there were several earlier emperors and then Vespasian and Titus and Domitian um, during that era, um, they were imposing, you must, you were, they're imposing on different cultures, different areas like the Druids and so forth. Um, you must recognize the Roman emperor. Uh, you must abide by these certain things uh, uh, that, you know, of Rome and so forth. And Israel would just not stand for it. <laughs> and, um, uh, one aspect in Jewish tradition, Jewish law, actually, one of the commandments is, I, I am Jehovah, your God, you will have no other gods before me. And if you had seen my earlier video, which is still trying to upload, uh, being be processed, um, I give the explanation as to why Jehovah is the proper pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton, of God's actual name, forever and ever. Uh, 
So anyway, uh, uh, the Jews would not stand for it. And there was a push towards a some kind of leader that would be king of Israel during a time after the Roman occupation has been overthrown. The third temple has been um, created because the second temple had just been destroyed. Well, was, um, yeah, it had just been destroyed, just been destroyed. And uh, there was a push. We will have our ideal, idyllic setting, so forth, under the kingdom of God and so forth. All right, so that was a sentiment. So, um, and Judah, the prince of the Sanhedrin, was uh, living around that, vaguely around that time. All right, so um, there are the, the three, three of the major Kabbalistic texts, the Sefer Yetzirah, the Bahir, and the Zohar. Um, be, I think because of, for whatever dating in terms of the phraseology, I don't know, understand exactly how they, it's been dated, this Yetzirah text which is quite short, but it's also one of my favorites because it, it, it's simple in some sense. Um, but even, even that, like other Kabbalistic texts, um, explain things in simple matter-of-fact terms, the nature of the universe in matter-of-fact terms, but um, there's still um, a kind of mystery behind mystery in it, even though it's explaining things in very um, matter-of-fact terms. It's hard to explain. Um, it's like it's like if you were to go up to a 10-year-old uh, and start explaining quantum physics. The 10-year-old would follow, perhaps follow, that you're saying these things and there are these aspects, but wouldn't be able to grasp and, and fully like contemplate what you're talking about. That's the best way I can explain Kabbalah. So the Yetzirah, um, Sefer means book. So Sefer Bahir, Sefer Yetzirah, Sefer Zohar, Sefer da 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 da, book of, book of, book of. All right. Yetzirah, Yetzer, Yotzer, is a term meaning form. So Sefer Yetzirah means book of formation. Now, I want, as I want to describe the tree of life in, moment, in this video, uh, I will explain what Yetzirah means, but briefly, you have emanations of worlds, um, or planes of existence. Uh, Bria, bore, bara, uh, means create. And then um, what you created are aspects which would become material in terms of uh, material that you would need in the world of formation to put together something greater. It's like if you um, you had a factory that's needed in order to manufacture an action figure. Well, you would need something to create the parts needed to create the tools needed to create the action figure. It's essentially that. So there's there are two different terms. There's bara and there's yetzira or yotzer. So um, without going into it, there's the, uh, the book of formation goes back that far. And then um, the book of uh, the, the Sefer Bahir is uh, translated as book of enlightenment. And then that was, I, if I remember correctly, it was somewhere closer to the Middle Ages, like 1000s or 1100s, something like that, as I recall. And then... These are not written by the same person, obviously, person, obviously, um, and they are slightly different. They're sort of different. They're, they're different books. They're different. The, the books are organized differently. The texts are organized differently, um, but they are talking about common concepts in Kabbalah. All right. So then the Zohar, um, and uh, there was somebody who claimed he found the Zohar, and people say that he actually wrote the Zohar, and that would have been maybe twelve. I'm maybe really off, but something like twelve hundreds or thirteen hundreds, something like that. Um, and the Zohar is a commentary on the five books of Moses. However, w with almost every verse, it goes further in its commentary, explaining Kabbalistic concepts, and there are lots of Kabbalistic concepts. 
the primary Kabbalistic concept I want to talk about. So it, it's intrinsic with Judaism. I mean, it uses Jewish, Kabbalah uses Jewish terminology. The very term Kabbalah comes from, it's a feminine, the ah part at the end indicates it's a feminine form of Kabbal. And perhaps um, it's, it's called feminine, it's termed feminine because it's um, receiving knowledge, receiving something from, in, Kab in Kabbalah, there's masculine and feminine. The masculine puts out, think of it in very anatomical fashion. The masculine generates and puts out and the uh, feminine receives and gestates. Okay, very direct. <laughs> um, so you got some Kabbalistic um, knowledge right there. All right, it's the tree of life. Now, something that I have yet to really study if I had time is the evolution of this tree of life it's a network of vessels it's a network of containers or vessels I'm gonna just go right in and, and refer to them by their uh, their Hebrew terms because it's awkward saying vessel and container and so forth I will just say sephira um, some people have pointed out that sapphire the term sapphire comes from sephira it's a container a vessel containing energy light okay that's that's what it is okay so it's a sephira the plural is sephirot uh feminine plural sephirot um all right so it's a network um and i will put it up here or there um a diagram of this network now i wanted to be clear on before i did this video i want to be clear uh uh refresh my memory you have Keter, as you'll see in this this diagram. Um, there, you have Keter at the top, which means crown, and then there are two on either side beneath that. Uh, those two, and then there's a third one below, Da'at. You have Chokma, Bina, and Da'at. That's the first triumvirate. Triumvirate meaning three of these Sephirot, and then. Beneath that, th 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 that's the mind aspect. And then beneath that, you have um, a triumvirate, again, of Chesed, Gevora, and Tiferet. Um, that's the second triumvirate, and that deals with um, action. And then the triumvirate below that, the third triumvirate below that, is uh, Netzach, Hod, and beneath that is Yesod. Now, uh, they operate in similar ways. Uh, there are, you can see it as two pillars with a middle pillar. Um, here's the concept. The top is the mind, the middle is the action, and the bottom is the relationship with other people. And beneath Yesod is Malkut, which means kingdom. Melech means kingdom. Um, Malkut means the outside kingdom interacting with others, interacting the outside world. All right, so um, you have, you, there's a uh, common form in this triumvirate of three, ignoring Keter for a moment, um, these three separate. Um, all the one, you know, um, hmm, I don't know how it'll appear in the image, but all the ones on the right side um, are, um, let me see, um, are pouring, deal with pouring out. You can think of it masculine and feminine ways. Um, they are, I, I want to say masculine, um, pouring out. The one that's the, on the right, the one on the left in each triumvirate, the one on the right receives it, receives the light, and because light is circulating through, receives the light, and it's, it could be termed feminine. It's restricting, deals with re, this, the, the, it deals with restriction, it deals with um, constraint and giving form. So one is pouring out and the other is receiving and then putting it into structuring it, giving limitation to what it's receiving and there, thereby giving it form the light some sense of form and limitation um, and that's a good thing that's um, 
to be protective and to make sure that it flows well and doesn't overpower. Um, there's a, somebody gave an analogy about rain that you can have lot, you can have rain, which is great and nourishes and it's outpouring, it's masculine, it's pouring out. But uh, if you have too much rain, then you get floods and people get killed, they suffocate, they drown. So you need some aspect that's receiving, feminine aspect, receiving it to restrict how much water is getting to you. Um, and just, just enough, uh, or I say enough, sufficient to be able to nourish without going overboard. Okay. Then the bottom one in each triumvirate, um, it, some people consider that a balance. Um, I suppose you can just call it, it's a, a, a good balance between the two. It's a reception. Um, there's a, a concept of um, father, mother, and child. All right. So going back a bit, um, there were different writings explaining Kabbalistic terms. And uh, in the Bahir, it mentions the these um, sephirot, uh, but it doesn't elaborate on them very much. That's a Bahir. And then the Zohar then further explains these different ones. And then there, there are questions um, about them or, or, um, well, there are still questions about how they form together. So then, um, um, Isaac Luria then gave lectures and explanations about how they do fit together. And he, he had a, I would say personally, he had a, a bias or a, a, his, not shtick, but his, um, personal take on it was in the form of rectification and the need for a Messiah um, and a need to repair the world. He was big on um, justice and making sure that the world is orderly and uh, peace and um, making, you know, making a better world that the, I would, I'm sure that if you were go to, to go ask him, what's the purpose of life or why are we here? He would say something like to make, to put justice into the world and uh, that every Jew should um, make this a better world. And that all deals with Tikkune um, Olam, uh, repairing the world because the world certainly needs repairing. So what I am explaining to you now, what I will explain probably in the next video because there's a lot already is um, the accumulation over time, I one might say evolution, or one could say further explanation. If you believe that all this had been from earlier back, the, this full explanation was the way it was earlier back uh, could be termed a full explanation, or you could see it as an evolution of ideas. Um, so you have this network you have the mind, you have action, and then you have it, uh, relationships, interactions with outside people. Now, um, uh, one pillar is called mer pillar of mercy, and that's basically the what I would call the masculine. It, it's the outpouring. The other one is severity. Um, it's the restriction. It's the uh, taking in only what's needed and not uh, not letting in too much and putting form on it. That's termed the pillar of severity. Again, these are like translating into English terms. Okay. So and then the middle would be the balance. All right. So again, ignoring, um, ignoring Keter at the top, which means crown. Okay. The top oh, in the mind, um, uh, Kolkmah, means wisdom um, and it's an outpouring of I'm, I'm it's an outpouring of, of wisdom of information um, in terms of light to Bina which then takes that and puts form to it and Bina um, can be translated as understanding 
So again, mother or father to mother to child. So uh, dot, the child, is knowledge, translated as knowledge. Um, and there are slight differences between wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. I don't like to call it wisdom. Um, sometimes Kolkma is uh, termed intellect. I hope you get the idea of basically what it is. Um, Da'at is knowledge, Bina is understanding, where it's it's put into form. Then, that's the mind, and then below that, the six beneath that um, are um, action and interaction with outside people. Uh, chesed in action, chesed is again outpouring in terms of action um, and Gavora is the opposite. It's the uh, restraint. You don't want to go too far in terms of giving. I like to term Chesed as like altruism. And Gavora, meaning you, uh, it's a restriction on how much you give out before it or without um, doing harm to yourself. And then Tiferet Beneath that is a child. It's a balance of the two. And then beneath that, in terms of interaction with other people, Neitzach, uh, as I understand it, literally translates as victory. It's also likened to endurance um, and perpetuity. So in terms of interacting with others, this is the best analogy I found for it. If you're teaching, if you're a teacher teaching a student, um, you really, you have, you feel this energy, great pent up energy to be able to pour out um, all this intellectual, um, uh, all this um, zest and emotional. By the way, the bottom, ignoring the mind, the, these bottom ones all deal with emotion. Um, this you want you feel so enthusiastic to share what you know about this topic that you're teaching the student, um, but the student must have hode, or there must be an element of hode in it. Hode um, refers to submission. I think it literally translates as submission, um, meaning you even though you feel this incredible excitement to. Um, to interact with the student, uh, you must submit a bit and have patience. Patience is a good word to use here. You have to restrain yourself so that you don't overwhelm the child and the child just become, could become confused and walk away and not want to talk about you, talk with you about that topic. Then comes Yesod and that's the balance. Of, uh, of the two, as I understand it. <clears throat> All right. So, um, there is a concept of, um, there's a rectification, so forth. Um, when it came to later on, when it came to um, Isaac Luria, he, ex he introduced, as I understand it, he introduces the concept, even though these terms had been used before in Kabbalistic texts, he as I understand it, he heavily uh, used it, couched it in these terms. He talked about um, part sufim, which which basically means faces, aspect, like personae. So we'll put aside the uh, the these sephirot for a moment. This network of sephirot. Um, he talked about the emanations of worlds. Uh, worlds, I don't know exactly how you would explain it, planes of existence. I don't want to call dimensions because that people don't really take, there are so many connotations when it comes to saying dimension. But um, think about it as just emanations of existence. So um, I'll start at the top. I'll start at the first one. You have and again, this is all the way further into Isaac Luria's time period, the way he explained it. You have you have the Ein Sof, which was before anything else. There, this is the creation myth of Kabbalah, 
uh, there was the Ain Sof, literally meaning there is without limit. Ain meaning there is not, and uh, Sof meaning limitation or boundary. There is not limitation. And the Ain Sof, for whatever reason, decided to create something beyond itself. I like to think of it as a way in which it could understand itself better through interaction with someone else. But for whatever reason, it um, it had to contract itself. And by contract, um, it's the term is seem zoom. It, it's more than simply limiting yourself in terms of size or scrunching up or something. There's more, much more to it than that, philosophically to it than that, um, and metaphysically. Um, it, it, it contracted itself, it seemed zoomed itself to create room outside itself for this creation. And then it emanated one emanation, which is, um, likened to, or its persona is Adam, like the Adam in the Bible, but Adam Kadman, which means, uh, primordial Adam, the early Adam, the ancient Adam. Um, and then, as I understand it, um, these different um, aspects that you would see more defined in the further later emanations, like the, the network that I was talking about of the Sephirot, um, existed within the Adam Kadman but they weren't delineated yet. They weren't separate yet. Uh, you can also think of this in terms of creative act. Uh, there's the tetragrammaton yud he vav he. Now um, yud is it appears like an apostrophe. It looks like an apostrophe. Now a little dot part of the apostrophe is um, if I have it right. This first admat. Adam Kadman, and it's called Kotz, and it, um, it's like an initial spark, a thought, like impulse to create, or, or it, it, a thought of what to create, um, and then the full, um, the full letter Yud would be, um, I'm pausing because I'm trying to line up uh, which goes corresponds with what. All right, so um, that apostrophe, or that yud, full yud, um, corresponds to Kadma, Adam Kadman, or the next Atsilut, corresponds to Atsilut, which means, um, it literally means emanation. Um, and that's the second world. So you have the Ain Sof, and then emanating from that, you have Adam Kadman. And then um, after that, you have Atsilut. And there's a part of the soul. The soul extends through these different uh, layers of worlds. Um, it's all one soul. Um, you have Yechida, which means singularity. You have yech, you have five of them. Um, so there are four worlds, and then there's a fifth world, um, Adam Kadma. So um, the Adam Kadma, the first emanation out from the Ain Sof, um, is the, the, the aspect of the soul, Yechida, uh, single, uh, united one singularity and then excuse me all right um so after that i'm sorry i've got to i've got to pause it i've got to stop this okay uh bear with me as i try to um explain it uh you have uh four uh, in the tetragrammaton the four letter four emanations and then there's a fifth one corresponding to that little tip, uh, quotes part of the first letter, uh, Yod. And you can liken it to the creative act, very much, very akin to the creative act. Um, it's likened 
in some text uh, to a glass blower, the uh, in terms of the parts of the soul, um, the five parts of the soul are yakida, chaya. Yakida means uh, single, refers to singularity, uh, singleness. Um, um, chaya means living. Neshema means breath. Ruach means wind. And nefesh. Um, I forget exactly what nefesh. It. Um, I think it, it's also something related to uh, breathing. So there's a text that likened this to a glass blower. The. Um, the valve in the middle is the actual pipe through which the the wind the breath though it goes through. Um, and then there are two parts before that. The first one is the inhaling. And then the second part is exhaling. And then the third part is um, the two, the two haze correspond to each other in terms of um, taking, expanding, taking up dimensions. So, um, you have the, the spark, the coats, the beginning, which would be the inhaling. The yud would be the um, glass blower. And then the uh, hay, first hay, would be the, um, I, I believe it's um, uh, inhaling, taking air into his, the glass blower's lungs. And then the vav, which is a straight line, which would be the pipe, would be the exhaling through the pipe into the space where the wind, the, the breath would go. Um, that would be the second hay. That would be uh, the, the, the wind or the breath taking up space. So that would be yud, hay, va. That would be the little coats and then the rest of the coat, the rest of the yud hey, vav, hey, or the five aspects of the soul. Okay, so there's each aspect corresponds or dominates or exists within a different uh, emanation. So you have the Ain Sof. Let me see if I have it. You have four emanations. Outside of that, you have two beyond the four. The four emanations are Atzilut emanation, Atzilut, um, Bria creation, and then Yetzirah would be formation, and then um, Asiya would be action. So the action, the Asiya world is our what we term what we see as our physical reality, and then a step the earlier emanation um, form, uh, would be formation, Yetzirah, um, would be the parts that you would need to form these aspects. And that, I might as well mention it now, that's akin to the Greek, well, uh, a, 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 a certain Greek philosopher's aspect, uh, Plato, Plato's concept that he wrote about and I'm very fascinated and, and curious about how much of this Kabbalah stems from Plato's ideas and Greek philosophers and so forth. Because it, it, I can talk about in other videos, um, I suspect that the Torah and Judaism as we understand it stems from the Greek period and cr from Greek um, philosophy. Okay, so... In Plato, uh, for Plato, um, he had this concept that there were that what we see in our physical reality were really shadows of idyllic forms in another uh, universe or plane of I'll use plane of existence, and he named off uh, certain perfect forms uh, the tr the uh, cube and the um, 
pyramid and the octagon and so I'm not sure if the octagon was in there but there's this the cube the pyramid so forth uh, and that what we see are shadows of those perfect forms so um, that would be akin to this where the world of formation would be what Plato might be what Plato or would be akin to what Plato was thinking about in terms of another world where these are their perfect forms and we're seeing shadows of them. Um, that would be Yetzirah and then an, a world before that or a world emanated uh, and cloaked within that whatever it would be um, yet the Bria world and that would that means creation and that's the creation of those perfect, for, perfect forms and then step before that a step before Bria you have Bria um, Bria oh Atsi Lut would be the would be emanation. Uh, I'm unclear as to what would be in this emanation world. A step before that is the Adam Kadma, which would be like the prototype or the technical aspects, uh, but not yet delineated and defined as being separate. There's no sense of separateness uh, of these other things that you would see in these further emanations, but they all exist within the Adam Kadma. And then before that, you have the Ein Sof. Um, I mentioned seem soon before that, um, that's a way of, it's term contracting, but it's, or hidden, or concealment, but um, on, on some level, all of these are one within Ain Sof, it's all Ain Sof, however, there's an illusion of separateness, especially, especially as you go further and further through the emanations to our, what we see as our physical world. Um, they seem more and more distant. All right, so um, going back to that diagram of the ten sephirot, uh, Keter at the top, there are three heads or uh, aspects or faces, pers personae, three personae of this head and uh, of this term, the sephirah called Keter. Uh, one of them is crown. There, there are three different meanings of Keter. Um, one means crown, and I forget what the other two are at the moment, um, but they, each of these meanings of Keter refer to different uh, traits that it has, different, like almost a different persona or characterization. Maybe characterization are good, is a good term for it. Different characterization that Keter embodies or, or uh, has, embodies, embodies. So one is crown, which um, is like, it acts like a garment. It uh, cloaks, it, it en envelops these, um, these separate, uh, I forget what the other two are. Uh, then, so that's Keter. Uh, then this is something I want to understand better. Um, there are three heads of Keter. There's one called the Ancient of Days, the Atik Yomin, literally means Ancient of Days. And then there's, and that, that Atik Yomin has associated with it um, the concept of pleasure and delight. And then um, beneath that, there's another one, there's um, emunah, which means faith, and I'm not entirely, there's a way of understanding how faith interacts. It's, from what I have read, it's like an overlapping of atik yomin and the third one, which would be ratzon, uh, which would be um, another one that has associated with it ratzon, which means will, intention, and the overlapping of this is faith, emunah. I don't quite yet understand geographically, pictorially, how that fits. But, okay, so you have the most ancient one, the Ancient of Days, Atik Yomin, which is associated with delight and pleasure. And then you have um, the... Uh, 
one that corresponds to, I think it's Zeir on pin or Ari, it's, I think it's Arich on pin, uh, which means like it, one means extended face, the other means uh, small face. I don't even want to get into that because I'm a little unclear as to which one matches with what. Um, but it's very pictorial if you're trying to figure this out in terms of diagrams. So a very nice concept, very concept, a concept that I'm very proud of that is in Judaism. Um, delight behind reason and intent. Uh, ratzon can be translated as will. It's also intention. It's like you're heading toward a certain path. You're willed, you have a will to go somewhere, you have motive force to go somewhere. But behind that, what's driving that is delight and pleasure. So you can think of it as um, the Ain Sof ha uh, first having pleasure or delight to create. And then came Ratzon, which would be a, an intention to create. And from that, you get the emanations. I hope this is clear. Um, even I'm under, I'm uncovering and understanding more about it. Again, there's that interla uh, uh, interfacing, which would generate the concept of faith. So um, in each emanation, there's a corresponding part of the soul. There are, um, there are aspects of each emanation and there's uh, uh, types of creatures. Oh, 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 I need to mention that, uh, or angel, angels um, corresponding to each world. Um, I need to talk about um, Keter, Again, uh, I need to talk about, um, not Keter, I need to talk about uh, the soul um, that's connected with the Nefesh. Yes, the Nefesh um, that is the part of the soul that is associated with our world, Asiya, which literally means doing. Asiya would relate, would translate as doing. And as I said before, the next world up would be uh, Yetzirah, which means formation. Next world up is Bria, which means creation. Next world up is Atzilut, which means emanation. So there are two, um, there's a higher and lower form of, or there's a higher and lower, uh, it's like, um, it's like Asiya, you know, in the world of Asiya, there's um, Nefesh 1 and Nefesh 2. Um, Nefesh 2 refers to um, um, self, uh, I want to say ego, it refers to uh, like gratification, I want, I must have, you know, I must have this, um, this zest to, t uh, to have. Um, and then there's a little, a higher Nefesh aspect, which is uh, taking into account other people uh, or other things beyond yourself, which helps limit what you uh, want to have or think that you should have. Um, then there are different creatures or angels um, associated with each emanation um, at this I, I don't even want to get into that because I'm, I'm rusty on which one corresponds with what. But um, if you look in the book of Ezekiel, um, that's where they get the names for the different categories of angels, each category co corresponding to a certain emanation in this. So I think that about does it for, for now. I'm going to hold off and probably make another video soon. Who? Uh... <laughs> Well, after recording all that and almost catching my, you know, uh, running out of breath, I wanted to, I couldn't finish the video without explaining this. So I popped open my window, my, I looked online. I wanted to explain the uh, part two theme or the characterizations. Um, I want to mention that there was also another person, a long, um, Independent of Isaac Luria, 
who had, uh, let me get this straight, I'll move this up here, um, Moses Ben or son of Jacob Cordovero. Um, I'll just read out what Wikipedia has under the article Partzufim, P-A-R-T-Z-U-F-I-M. In fact, I'll read it off. Um, means divine personas are particular reconfigured arrangements of the ten sephirot, divine attributes or manifestations, emanations of Kabbalah. Each part suf is thus a configuration of disparate entities into a harmonious unit. The names of the part sufim are derived from the Zohar. I, you remember before I'd mentioned the Zohar as being the third of the what I would call the great, the three great. Um, texts in Kabbalah. There they are synonymous terms for sephirot or containers, vessels. Um, their full doctrinal significance emerged in 16th century, that would be 1500s, Lurianic Kabbalah, meaning um, the Kabbalah uh, uh, variation, version, as talked about by Isaac Luria. Um, their full doctrinal significance emerged in 16th century Lurianic Kabbalah with reference to the cosmic processes of Tohu and Tikkun, meaning chaos and rectification. Um, uh, you remember before I, I mentioned Tikkune Olam, meaning repair of the world or re rectification of the world, rectification being, um, being put in, in order, into order from chaos. And tohu is a term from straight from the uh, Genesis chapter one, um, where it talks about before the um, before the uh, six days, it said the world was tohu and vohu. Um, medieval Kabbalah described this, the ten sephirot as divine channels that emanate from their source and descend into a linear progression. Moses Ben Jacob Cordovero systemized the different medieval interpretations of the Zohar. Later, Isaac Luria recast Kabbalah into its second articulation. Lurianic Partsufim, the, the uh, divine personae, um, described the dynamic relationships between personas which interact with each other. The higher Partsufim clothe themselves within its lower ones as a soul is, in, is clothed in a body. So you have, this is a, a distinct concept in Kabbalah. Um, you have a thing and then you have a shell that's, or garment, oftentimes it, it uses the, the analogy of a garment put over, but you mustn't mistake the thing for the garment that it's wearing. So very much enclosed within, enclosed within, encompassed within. Um, according to the Lurianic system, the linear scheme of Sephirot pre um, precipitates the shattering of, to okay, that goes into the shattering of the vessels. I don't even want to get into that. All right, so what I wanted to do was get to the um, Partsufim themselves. Okay, so you have... The Ancient of Days, which I had mentioned before, uh, that's the inner, so you have Keter, you have, um, here it mentions two aspects of Keter, or two personae of Keter. Um, you have the Ancient of Days, which corresponds to delight, and it's the most primary, earliest cause. And then you have Arik on pin, which means long face. Um, I think it literally means long nose. Um, and it's the descending divine soul in creation. So you have the Ancient of Days, and then that's enclosed within um, the Arik on pin, which I get the impression of something stretched. And if I have it correctly, it stretches down towards the other sephirot, or the other worlds, extends through the worlds. All right. Um, so the these are both male. Uh, the, the, the thing itself is male, and these are two part, uh, characteris characterizations or personae, or persona. It's a persona of it. Um, you have the nukva da'atik yomi, female of the Ancient of Days. 
That's interesting. Oh, oh, strike that. Okay, so you have, I guess at the beginning you have um, masculine and feminine intertwined. It's the lower ones have distinction between masculine and feminine uh, in order to generate. Um, Nukva, you have Atik Yomin is male ancient of days. And then Nukva de Atik Yomin, female of ancient of days. Um, all right, so then that's related to Keter, the two um, personae of Keter. Then beneath that, in the chart that you I had shown you, you have Kokma on one side. That relates to wisdom. Um, there are two personae. Each one has a... I'm a little unclear on this. It, each one has two personae. One is, one is greater. There's a greater and lesser light. I'm trying to figure out what that corresponds to or that how that fits in that might fit in with this but there's there's um a more a, 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 a one counterpart one one manifestation i'll use the term manifestation there's one manifestation of kokma that's related to more i would i would call more supernatural this ancient aspect and then there's one that's closer to more earthbound. All right, so in Kokma, the one that's related to the more supernatural aspect is father, the higher father. The power to spontaneously extract insight from the superconscious realm. And that's what I was talking about, where the light goes from Keter to Kokma, and then from Kokma to Bina, and then Bina to Da'at, and further down. So Kokuma is the father, and it's in that um, pillar of mercy. It pours out. It, all the ones in this pillar have the concept of, all the sephirot in this pillar have the concept of pouring out. And then the female counterpart receives it and puts limitation to it. So the, I would, what I would call supernatural, um, grander, like more supernatural manifestation of it is... Um, the higher father, and then the um, lower, more earthly manifestation of it is Israel, the, the elder, the power to subsequently direct insight into consciousness. And both of these are masculine. All right, so then you go to the counterpart, which is Bina, and um, its more supernatural aspect is, or super, supernatural um manifestation or, or um, identity is Ima, mother, joined influence with Abba, father, nurturing development. Um, and then the more, the one closer to our earthly um, world is Tavuna, comprehension. That's Bina, they're both feminine. So then they, the masculine and feminine, both um, Reproduced. They had the light goes from Kokma to Bina, and Bina gives form to the light, and then it goes down to Da'at, meaning knowledge, and that's uh, considered the sun. So that's where we go to next. Um, Zer on pin means small face. Uh, Arik on pin means extended nose or extended face, and uh, Zer on Zer on pin mean small face um, and those relate to the uh, six ones beneath the six separate beneath the top mind ones of Kokma and Bina and Da'at so in some sense these are encased within Da'at um, it's as if you were looking into Da'at and seeing these it depends on perspective seeing these lower six within Da'at um, all right, so this is sun, of course, masculine. Um, Zair on pin, uh, reveal sun, groom seeking unity with Nukva, Nukva being the daughter, I'll mention in a moment. Nukva would be Malkut, which would be kingdom. So you have Da'at, and then within Da'at, you have the six Sephirot, uh, meaning Gavora, Chesed, Gavora. Tiferet, Netzach, and Hod, and Yesod would be the six within Da'at. 
So Da'at would be the son, and then the daughter would be Malkut, beneath that. Um, so going back to Da'at, um, it's the groom seeking unity with Nukva, the daughter, Torah study, written Torah, sun, tree of life, sun meaning S-U-N, revelation of divine transcendence, the tetragrammaton, the yud Hey vav Hey, and also the phrase, the Holy One, blessed be He. All right. So uh, then there are two parts to theme there's, uh, that it's known for. Uh, Yisrael, if you notice in the Torah, um, the character of Jacob has two names, Jacob and Israel. And there are two different stories as to how Jacob got the name Israel. But um, Yisrael would be the face that looks up and Jacob is the uh, father of the Israelites. So there's one in these two ones below here, there's one that looks upward and then there's another, there's an, one identity of it that looks upward and there's another identity that simply is as is straightforwardly. Um, so Jacob is the, the biblical character. You know, Jacob is the uh, father of the Israelites and the, his manifestation or his characterization that looks upward is known as Yisrael. And it's interesting. I wonder if this concept goes back that far or that was in the mind of the writer or writers who wrote the Torah. Um, or if this came later on and later it was a later interpretation of it. So you also have the same thing with da, beneath Da'at and those six within Da'at. Uh, with Malkut, which means kingdom. Um, here it's known as the daughter um, receiving, the re it's the receiving daughter, uh, receiving because masculine and feminine, the feminine receives from the masculine. Um, bride seeking unity with Ze'er on pin, um, which I believe is the short, the small face or small nose. Um, prayer, Oral Torah, so you have, it's interesting, you have the written Torah in terms of the son, and the oral Torah is the, uh, is the daughter. I wonder what, why the distinction there. Prayer, oral Torah, moon, ah, oh, it's interesting, that's where you get the sun. Um, Jacob would be related to the sun, and uh, here, or the sun would be, the S-O-N would be related to S-U-N. Here, the daughter would be related to the moon. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Imminence, Elohim. Oh, yes. Um, this actually corresponds with other research I've read. Uh, there's another person I've, I've been following. Uh, uh, there's a book um, that he had published, and I read it. Very fascinating. The website is called chaver .org or .com, I'm trying to remember, .org, I think, chaver.com. Um, in which he points out, it's very clear, he uh, found a pictorial way of, uh, first of all, he found there, there, what seems to be an intentional division of the whole Torah text, all five books, divided into units of a few verses each, and, and there are five layers of these arrangements, so that the largest arrangement has a vertical and horizontal crisscrossing all five books. Uh, um, the, the vertical thing is Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And then the line going across is Genesis, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. It's a whole separate video. I feel I've cre recorded and I'll, I could get into later. But it's interesting that in that he presents three, like that, that what the author or authors seem to be intentionally um, hiding this, but it's very clear if you, once you see it, you notice it's very clear in the Torah text. Um, there are three levels, and yud Hey vav Hey, the tetragrammaton, would be in the top layer, and Elohim is on the bottom layer. Te uh, tetragrammaton, or yud Hey vav Hey, and Elohim are the two primary names used for the Israelite God in the Torah and in uh, Jewish texts in general. 
And so Elohim seems to be connected with the imminence. I don't mean eminent like great. I mean imminent as in closeness or nearness, Very the one very near to us on earth, um, in our realm, physical realm. And yud heh vav -Hey would be the one in the heavens. That's why the uh, smoke of the, it mentions the, smoke of the burnt offerings, the smell of the burnt offerings rises up to the nostrils of yud heh vav -Hey. um, So even here, um, uh, it mentions, first of all, the imminence or closeness of Elohim, and that's connected with um, the daughter, which would be Malkut, which literally, Malkut literally means kingdom. Okay, in this diagram, Malkut is literally kingdom, and According to this Wikipedia article, one of the associations of Malkut is to the, the daughter, which is one of the characterizations or, or personae, one of the identities, one of the manifestations of Malkut or, um, yeah, of Malkut. And that's associated with the imminence and Elohim. And then above that, you have... Um, the sun, which is associated with, uh, which is Zair on pin, which is the small nose, uh, or sometimes translated as small face, um, and that's associated with the Tetragrammaton, and it says divine, even here the article says revelation of divine transcendence. So even here it's, it's correlated, it's driving. Uh, you have the imminence of Elohim, very close to us, and then you have the divine transcendence of um, yud heh vav -Hey in the heavens. And there's this middle plane, well, at least in this, in Kaver Dakami, that author talks about this middle layer that uh, exists the, as an intermediary between these two extremes. So, um, whereas, remember earlier, I was talking about the sun having two identities. Um, there's one that looks upward, and then there's one that just is. The one that just is is Jacob. The one that looks upward is uh, Yisrael. And the one that just is is Jacob. So that's the sun. Then beneath that, Malkut. And remember again, I I must mention that the there are the six Sephiroth, um, Gevorah, Chesed, Tiferet, Netzach, and Hod, and Yeso. Those are the ones within Da'at um, or associated with Da'at. So you have basically Da'at and Malkut. So um, Malkut is, there are two of them, and I'm guessing the one that's, well, no, I don't want to guess. I will simply say here, one is Leah and one is Rachel or Rachel. Um, it doesn't refer to one as looking upward and, and one not looking upward. It just presents two of them, at least in this article. It mentions Leah being the first wife of Jacob and Rachel or Rachel being the second wife of Jacob. Um... So I wanted to, um, I wanted to fit that in there. All right. So also, uh, besides the part two theme, uh, the characterizations or identities, I also, I didn't want to leave this video, leave out of this video, uh, this other aspect called the divine, the 13 divine attributes. All right. What are they? Um, uh, because they're talked about, uh, quite a lot in Kabbalah. Um, there, the 13 attributes of mercy um, in the portion called, of the portion of Exodus, uh, specifically um, 13, or no, sorry, uh, Exodus 30, 34, 6 to 7 uh, are the divine attributes uh, with which, according to Judaism, God governs the world. Now, why is this important? Um, it uh, in Kabbalah, the it's very picturesque and it's it relies very much on analogy, an allegory. Um, the face of God or um, this image has um, thirteen whiskers or hairs, and then there's a gap in the middle. Um, those are referring to the thirteen attributes of mercy. Um, now let me go to what, uh, 30, Exodus 34, six to seven actually describes. Um, 
uh, God comes down in a cloud and proclaims the Lord, the Lord, or Jehovah, uh, Jehovah, a God compassionate and gracious, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. He does not remit all punishment, but visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generations. Moses, now I'm reading a summary here. Moses bows low and asks God to accompany the people in their midst, da 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 and pardon. Okay, now I'm going to get to the more Kabbalistic aspect, Kabbalistic significance of this. Um, the 13 attributes closely parallel the description of God's nature in the second of the commandments, um, except that God is characterized as merciful rather than zealous. Thus, they represent a covenant between God and Israel, replacing the covenant of the Ten Commandments, which was broken by the golden calf sin. When Moses later mentions the 13 attributes as an argument for sparing the Jewish people after the sin of the spies, he was referencing this covenant um, according, okay, according to Maimonides, uh, I will go into who Maimonides was. He's a famous Jewish philosopher. The 13 attributes are not qualities inherent in God, but rather are methods of his activity. So they're not within him, intrinsically within him, but they are more related to um, his interaction with uh, Israel and with humanity. By which the divine governance appears to the human observer to be controlled. This understanding is confirmed by the C phrase. I'm not sure what that refers to. Um, anyway, where these attributes are not called are not called midot, which could mean attribute, but rather dirachim, ways. That's just what I said. It sounds like just what I said. They're not uh, those. Those aren't intrinsic aspects of God, but behaviors of or interaction aspects of interactions of God which Moses prayed to know and which God proclaimed to him. Okay, um, I should mention, now I will jump back and mention who Maimonides is. Um, lived between 1138 and 1204, um, also referred to by the acronym ROMBOM, which stands for, oh, they don't give what it's, it's Rabbi... Um, the uh, uh, altogether would spell out Rambam, but it would be Rabbi da something 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 something. Um, be an acronym as the acronym would be Rambam. Okay, um, he was a Sephardic rabbi, meaning he was about uh, somewhere in France and Spain. Um, rabbi and philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages. In his time, he was also a preeminent astronomer and physician, serving as the personal physician of Saladin. He was born and lived in uh, Cordoba, which is now Spain. I mean, the aspect where, which is now called Spain. Da, 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 da. During his lifetime, most Jews greeted Maimonides' writings on Jewish law and ethics with acclaim and gratitude, even as far away as Iraq and Yemen. Yet while Maimonides rose to become the revered head of the Jewish community in Egypt, his writings also had vociferous critics, particularly in Spain. Um, he died and da-da-da-da-da. Um, he was posthumously acknowledged as one of the foremost rabbinic decisions, uh, decisors, weird term decisor, but anyway, decision makers, and philosophers in Jewish history and his copious work comprises a cornerstone of Jewish scholarship. His 14 volume Mishneh Torah still carries significant canonical authority as a condition of a codification of halakha, meaning um, customs and uh, uh, customs and ways of Jew, you know, Jewish ethical laws. Roughly, that's my wording of it. Um, all right, so going back to these 13 attributes, um, okay. Uh, okay, so the, the number 13 is adopted from Talmudic, and as I said before, the Talmud was um, started off as a collection of six categories of oral uh, customs and laws. Um, there's no way, real word, um, 
traditional um, decision. Uh, the way you know to build a community, there are certain laws that you you put at you you formulate, and he categorized and wrote down six categories of these, and then there were further comment. There was a further commentary added onto it, and then there were over time there were other um, commentaries added on by rabbis. Uh, and then it was all essentially standardized at some point into the Talmud. Okay, um, the number 13 is adopted from Talmudic and rabbinic tradition. There are divergent opinions as to the correct division of the biblical words between attributes. Shadal, um, I won't even, I don't know who Shadal is, but I won't go into, you can uh, look it up. Um, all right, I'll look up below. Um, Samuel David Luzzato, also known by the Hebrew acronym Shadal, was an Italian-Austrian Jewish scholar, poet, and a member of the Wissenschaft des Judentums movement. Okay. He describes no fewer than 13 such opinions. According to some, the 13 attributes begin with the first Adonai in verse 6 of um, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 to whatever it was, 9. Um, in verse 6, and so begin the 13, according to some, the 13 attributes would begin with the first Adonai in verse 6 and end with the word ve nake in verse 7. The single attributes are contained in the verses as follows. Compassion before a person sins, compassion after a person has sinned, possessing the power to bestow kindness. Uh, that And then the fourth one is that humankind may not be distressed. If humankind is already in distress, slow to anger, um, plenteous in kindness, plenteous in kindness, I guess that means plenty in kindness. It's chesed, that term, that, um, remember that attribute, chesed, uh, altruism, outpouring, um, plentiful in kindness and truth, is number eight. Truth is number eight. Seven is plentiness and kindness. Um, and then nine is keeping kindness unto thousands of generations. Um, and in the Torah scroll, when, when you write this verse in the Torah scroll, the nun, the letter nun in the verse is enlarged. That's interesting. Um, Ten, uh, forgiving iniquity, 11 and transgression, 12 and sin, 13 and pardoning. So those are the 13 and they're characterized as 13 um, whiskers of a beard on uh, the divine face. And in the middle, um, I read somewhere uh, earlier this morning that truth represents the um, middle part that has no whiskers. I'm wondering where truth is in... Yes, number eight, um, right between seven and nine. So I wanted to get that part in. All right. Thank you for having watched this video, especially if you've made it this far. I don't know how many of you have, but I promise as I'm evolving this channel, I'm figuring out ways of doing it, the, producing these videos better and um putting in as much quality as I can. Granted, there wouldn't be any, uh, you know, if I had more time to be able to devote to this, they would look better. But I appreciate you watching and consider subscribing to my channel where you can learn about other theories and uh, avenues of intellectual pursuit I, I pursue. Uh, and spread the word about this channel and like this video and watch my other videos that go on explore and i hope you have a good memorial day and a good weekend bye bye